All right, so today's class is um, a little parenthesis in our study on covenant theology. It's just uh, essentially covenant theology or dispensationalism. We're going to essentially look at this other competing system um, for how to structure scripture. Now, um, depending on who you talk to, uh, will largely kind of determine uh, when dispensationalism developed. Some dispensationalists will claim that uh, it began and can be traced back all the way to the early church fathers. Paul ends in his uh, book, The Moody Handbook of Theology, claims that Justin Martyr, uh, AD 110 to 165, Irenaeus, 130 to 200, Clement of Alexandria, 150 to 220, and even Augustine, 354 to 430, um, all held to um, early forms of dispensationalism. Now he claims that he claims that because these men saw different time periods in redemptive history. And I would just say to that, okay, well, we see different time periods in redemptive history as well, but that doesn't make us dispensationalists. Now I'm not sure about Arrhenius or Clement of Alexandria, but both Justin Martyr and Augustine both believed that the church um, made up of Jews and Gentiles was the true Israel of God. And that view is kind of practically heresy to dispensationalism. Now, C.I. Schofield, as I mentioned earlier, um, 1843 to 1921, is the man who popularized the system. Um, but it is John Nelson Darby, 1800 to 1882, who is almost universally recognized as the father of dispensationalism. Darby was an Irishman um, who was part of a movement called the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, during the latter part of the 19th century, he developed this system. Um, and as, essentially, it's a system that um, was very novel um, compared to, you know, 1,700 years of church history prior to him developing it. Um, now, Schofield, an American, took the ideas of Darby and other dispensationalism, uh, dispensationalists, and he crystallized it into the 1909 publication of the Schofield Study Bible. And this study Bible spread like wildfire uh, in the United States. And Schofield released his second edition in 1917, where it remained untouched until modern dispensationalists revised it in 1967. Now, having said that, uh, there are different kind of streams of dispensationalism, but, but most of the key ingredients remain the same in both. So let me give you just a disclaimer, okay? Uh, Michael J. Glodo provides us with a, a helpful thing to remember as we begin. Quote, dispensational theologians have been quite active during the past few decades in refining their system of biblical analysis. Certainly it would not be fair to treat the dispensationalist today as though his modes of expression were identical to those which characterized the old Schofield Bible as it appeared in 1909. Yet, at the same time, these early foundations cannot be ignored altogether. For the earlier dispensational theology continues to provide the basic motive for dispensationalism today. So, essentially what he's saying is that Modern dispensationalism is different than the roots of it. It's different in some of the fruit that's hanging on the tree. Um, but the roots underneath the ground all have the same presuppositions. Okay, so um, like I said, this is the water that we're swimming in. So uh, popular forms of dispensationalism are seen in Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. I remember reading that book when I was a kid. And uh, just struck with the idea that I'm, I'm so glad that, that God didn't come back yet because otherwise I wouldn't be in heaven. And I was. That's, that was a true form of worship. But his book was, was based on dispensationalism. Also the Left Behind book series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. Very dispensationalist. Uh, very dispensationalist. Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary is kind of the the main seminary that, that still uphold these ideas today. And then you have teachers like John MacArthur, Charles Ryrie, Chuck Swindoll, J. Vernon McGee, all faithful men, uh, but men who hold to these ideas. 
Um, so we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the, the definition of dispensationalism, the distinctives, I meant to say, of dispensationalism, and then what I consider the dif deficiencies of dispensationalism. So let's first of all look at the definition. Now whenever you add an ism to any word, it essentially becomes a worldview, a, a way of looking at the world. So think of atheism or um, agnosticism um, or Gnosticism or Calvinism, all of those are, are worldviews. And dispensationalism is no different. It's a system, it's a framework for understanding how God works out the progress of redemptive history. The word dispensation is uh, found in scripture, at least in the older translations. Um, it comes from the Greek word uh, oikonomeia, and it's biblical usage. It means stewardship, or administration. So let me write that on the board. So it means stewardship or administration. That's probably not super helpful, um, but I as we go on, I think it'll become a little bit more clear. Um, Ephesians 1.10, in the old King James Version, uses the word. It says uh, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are both in heaven and earth, um, all things in Him. Okay, and then that word is also used again in the King James Version in Luke chapter 16, 2 and 4, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Ephesians 3, 2, Colossians 1, 25. Okay, now the Schofield Study Bible, when it uses this word dispensation, here's how Schofield defines it. Schofield defines it as a period of time during which man is tested in respect to some specific revelation of the will of God. So that's what a dispensation is according to Schofield. A period of time during which man is tested in respect to some specific revelation of the will of God. So in dispensationalism, the whole Bible is seen to be split up in different time periods in which humanity faces a particular test. So Paul N. Uh, Paul ends a dispensationalism expand a dispensationalist expands this idea. He says this quote: Dispensationalism views the world as a household that's run by God. In this divine household, God gives man certain responsibilities as administrator. If man obeys within that economy or dispensation, then God promises blessing. If man disobeys, God promises judgment. Thus, there are three basic aspects norm normally seen in dispensations. Number one, testing. Number two, failure. Number three, judgment. In each dispensation, God has put man under a test. Man fails, and then there is judgment. Now, right away, um, you should be able to see that this is very similar to what we've been looking at with covenant theology. Um, very very similar, but it's the details that, um, that we're going to see 
really um, distinguish it from covenant theology. So let's look then at those specific distinctions of dispensationalism. That's our second point. So the first distinction within dispensationalism is that there are different periods of testing. Different periods of testing. And there are seven such dispensations. Of course, there are, again, different um, species of dispensationalism. Some dispensationalists believe there are nine different dispensations. Uh, but this is the most popular form. So there's the dispensation of innocence. This runs from um, creation to the fall. There's the dispensation of conscience. And that runs from the fall to the flood. There's the dispensation of government, and that runs from Noah to Babel. There's the dispensation of promise, which is Abraham to the Exodus. There's the dispensation of law, which is the kind of the longest one, which is Mount Sinai to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. There's the dispensation of grace, which is Pentecost to the rapture. And then there's the the, pen, the, the dispensation of the millennium, uh, which is essentially the, the 1,000 year kingdom after Jesus returns and right before the consummation of all things. Okay, so eternity is essentially the new heavens and the new earth is after that. Now, according to uh, the Schofield Study Bible, uh, what, what makes this system different than covenant theology? Because remember, I mean, the last couple of weeks we've been putting, you know, epic. The epic of, you know, the, the fall to the flood, the, the flood to Abraham, the, the epic of Abraham to Moses. So we've been kind of dividing up the Bible along similar lines, right? But the difference is, according to the Schofield Study Bible, is that mankind is saved differently in each of these dispensations. They're saved differently in each of these dispensations. Um, now, we'll see in a moment that Schofield goes so far as to say that under the dispensation of law, right here, that humanity was saved by obedience to the law. Now, since then, dispensationalists have changed their view. Um, some hold that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith alone, on the basis of the Calvary work of Christ alone. However, the object of their faith was not Christ, but some specific revelation of the will of God that God gave to them. Um, others, other dispensationalists say, no, 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 that's wrong. Christ has always been the object of saving faith in every dispensation. And that's certainly what guys like MacArthur would hold to. That's why he calls himself a leaky Dispensations, and we're thankful for that leakiness. Um, okay, that, that's the first distinction. The second distinction is um, that there are two different two different peoples of God. Who are the two different peoples of God? Anybody know? That's right. So Israel and actually it's not it's not strictly Jews and Gentiles. It's Israel and the church. Israel and the church. Those are the two different peoples of God. In the Old Testament, the people of God was the Israel. In the New Testament, the people of God is the church. Um, and this is what Paul ends again says. 
Uh, quote, dispensationalism is nowhere more distinctive than in its doctrine of the church. Dispensationalists hold that the church is entirely, let me do it like this, entirely distinct from Israel. Um, Israel always denotes the physical posterity of Jacob and is never to be confused with the church. God has a distinct program for Israel and a distinct program for the church. Now on the website PlymouthBrethren.org, uh, Henry Ironside calls the church, uh, he's a dispensationalist, a parenthesis in God's plan. In other words, uh, God's dealings with ethnic Israel is the main story of the Bible. And then the church is an insertion, a parenthesis that, that uh, interrupts that main story. Um, so Schofield in his introduction to the New Testament, this is right in here. In between the New Testament and the Old Testament, Schofield says this, quote, When we approach the study of the Gospels, your mind should be freed so far as possible from mere theological concepts and presuppositions. Now, he's going to give you a mere theological concept and a presupposition right now, okay? Especially it is necessary to exclude the notion, a legacy in Protestant thought from post-apostolic and Roman Catholic theology, that the church is true Israel and that the Old Testament foreview of the kingdom is fulfilled in the church. So he's, he admits that the, that, that the church is true Israel. He admits that that was the view going back to the, the apostolic fathers and it's been throughout church history but now he's saying don't take that view D don't hold on to to mere theological presuppositions but hold on to this mere theological presupposition okay um, the church is not Israel he says Israel is not the church two different peoples two different programs two different plans um, now unfortunately um, that is all the time that we have in terms of these two distinctions. There are many more. Um, one distinction is that dispensationalists hold uh, to a what they claim to be a literal hermeneutical interpretive method. They insist that it's they who interpret the Bible according to its literal or plain meaning. Secondly, uh, dispensationalists almost universally hold to a pre-tribulation rapture followed by a seven-year tribulation and a thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth, followed then by the consummation of all things. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into these things. I picked these two because I wanted to compare dispensationalism against covenant theology um, and then test it against Scripture. So then, let's finally look at this last point. The deficiencies of dispensationalism. So let's look at the first one. Are there deficiencies in looking at the Bible like this? Well, according to the Schofield Bible, again, each of these seven distinct periods of time has a character exclusively... Um, its own, being wholly complete and sufficient in itself. In other words, it is, um, it is not exchangeable for the others and these different dispensations can't be co-mingled. Um, now, that statement alone should help us to see that, that dispensationalism and covenant theology are at odds with each other. They can't be synthesized. Um, one of them is wrong. Um, remember, covenant theology, the analogy is that it's a, redemptive history is a dark room and God lights a candle every time he makes a covenant, thereby illuminating the one room. Uh, that covenant gives revelation to our eyes so that we see uh, uh, um, uh, eventually the, the, the full figure of that promised one in Genesis 3.15, right? Um, so when God lights another candle, when He makes another covenant, He doesn't blow out the first one. Each covenant 
is a, a still standing throughout all of redemptive history. They don't go away. So, set against that kind of analogy, di dispensationalism um, can't be said to, to have that one room. In fact, it can't even said to have multiple rooms because none of these different dispensations can be commingled, as as Schofield said. Charles Ryrie, a, a later dispensationalist, said that uh, these dispensations are not stages um, in the revelation of the covenant of grace, but they are distinguishably different from one another. And again, why? Because man is saved differently here than he is here. It's a different gospel message here than here or here or here. Um, uh, Schofield, when he was describing the Israelites moving from the Abrahamic, when, when Schofield describes the Israelites moving from this covenant to this covenant, he, he describes it like this. The dispensation of promise ended when Israel rashly accepted the law, Exodus 9, 8. At Sinai, at Mount Sinai, Schofield says, they exchanged grace for law. Now what's, what's wrong with that? Schofield said Israel rashly accepted the law and at Sinai, they exchanged grace for law. That's a complete misunderstanding of Exodus. The Israelites were graciously brought out of their slavery in Egypt. They were wicked just like their captors. And they were wicked just like those ones they're about to displace in the promised land. The Israelites didn't choose the Lord. He sovereignly imposed his covenant upon them without reference to what they wanted. And, and the law... Um, um, under this view of, of Schofield, uh, Schofield makes the law sound like a bad thing. They rashly accepted the law. Um, if the law is a reflection of God's perfect righteousness, what does Schofield's comment say about God? Um, Schofield, intentionally or not, is misrepresenting the intent of the law. Um, the law leads us to Christ, Galatians 3.24. It's the law is the psalmist's delight, Psalm 1, 1 through 2. The law is perfect, uh, uh, Psalm 19.7. The law is holy, uh, Romans 7.12. So, I mean, Schofield seems to have a very um, negative view of the law. In fact, um, Dispensationalists, particularly Schofield, held to the same misunderstanding that the Judaizers had of the law. Does anybody know what view the Judaizers had about the law? Why, why, were, the why were they the enemies of the gospel? How did they understand and interpret the law? Did they obtain righteousness by following That's right. Perfect summary. When Schofield comments on John 1.17, John 1.17 is a very, very famous verse. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is what Schofield says about that verse. He says, um, The dispensation of grace begins with the death and resurrection of Christ. The point of testing in this dispensation is no longer obedient, legal obedience as the condition of salvation, but accept, acceptance or rejection of Christ with good works as a fruit of salvation. Let me... Let me Interpret what Schofield's saying. He's saying that now that Christ has come, we are saved differently. Men and women used to be saved by the law, obedience to the law, but now we're saved by, by faith in Christ. 
um, he, he understood the law like the Judaizers, and that's exactly what Paul seeks to um, undermine in the book of, of Galatians. Um, now, if it's denied by, by our dispensationalist brothers um, that man could in fact keep the law, which they should deny that, then they would have to concede that no one could be saved. <laughs> in that previous dispensation. But if they were to respond by saying, well, that's why they had the sacrifices, the, the, the blood atonement to atone for their sins, well, then we would just point them to Hebrews 10.4. It says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That, that was also one of the misunderstandings of the Judaizers. They believed that, that righteousness could be attained through the law. They didn't believe that they were sinless. When they sinned, then their righteousness was restored through those sacrifices. Um, is that the point of the sacrifices in the Old Testament? No. Those sacrifices were to point forward to the ultimate Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Now, if a dispensationalist at this point were to say, yeah, I, I agree with all that, well, then that destroys Schofield's claim in John 1.17, and, and it really destroys the idea that men are saved differently in each one of these dispensations. Now, are there different epochs or, or time periods in, in Scripture? Of course there are. Um, we've been showing that. Um, However, throughout all these different time periods, there's only one unified plan of God. And Jesus gave us that one unified plan on the road to Emmaus when he was speaking to his disciples after the resurrection. He said, was it... So, so he, he uh, opened up Moses and all the prophets and he said, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then he showed them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What Bible did, did Jesus have at that point? He didn't have the New Testament. He only had the Old Testament. All right, so that, that's, distinction, or that's the deficiencies of, of distinction number one. Now let's look at the deficiencies of this view. The church in Israel, two different peoples, two distinct programs, two distinct peoples. Um... Now, the dispensationalists will say that nowhere in Scripture does the church equal Israel. Uh, they will say that those who uh, do not hold this distinction are, are what's called replacement theologians uh, because we allegedly believe that the church is replacing Israel. But, but that's in logic called a straw man. Uh, the church, no, no covenant theologian ever has said or believes that the church is uh, replacing Israel. No believing Jew will ever be replaced by a believing Gentile. No believing Jew will ever fail to inherit the promises that were made to Abraham. True Israel is all of God's people. Um, if you have been brought to Christ, you are part of God's people. Um, God has always had one people. Uh, when we see the New Testament authors or what we see the New Testament authors doing is explaining and interpreting the Old Testament to show just this. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. So, a lot of what the New Testament does is interpret the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews is interpreting the Old Testament. The book of Romans is interpreting the Old Testament. That's what they're doing all the time. So look how Paul here at the end of Galatians is interpreting circumcision and the people of God. Chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, Paul says, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, who is Paul talking about here when he calls these people the Israel of God? 
Dispensationalists will say that the Israel of God here are Jewish Christians. Not Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians. Now, covenant theologians and the majority of church history prior to the 20th century say that this is speaking of the whole church. Even Schofield himself admits this to be the case. So, how do we understand this phrase, the Israel of God? Well, just consider the whole argument in the book of Galatians. I have a bunch of verses that I could quote here, but just consider what is the argument of the book of Galatians? Paul shows up in Galatia or Antioch and Peter has separated himself from the Gentiles because he fears the circumcision party. He's, he has a fear of man. And so there's this division that's happening in the church. We're Jewish Christians. We're Gentile Christians. The Judaizers were saying, unless you're circumcised um, according to the law, you aren't a real Christian. And so then Paul swoops in and he says, you're understanding the gospel all wrong. Um, he, in fact, he condemns, Paul condemns Peter's separation from the Gentiles as hypocrisy in uh, Galatians 2, 11 through 14. In Galatians 3, 7, he says, look, who are the real sons of Abraham? All those who have faith in Christ. In Galatians 3, 28 and 29, he goes further. He says, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no slave, no free, no male, no female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So being in Christ means that you are a true son or daughter of Abraham. Um, now, wouldn't it be strange... That Paul, making this whole argument in the book of Galatians, saying, no, 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 you're one, you're one, you're one, you're one. And then it gets to the end and he says, oh, but you're really two. He would undermine his complete argument. No, Paul, when he says the true the Israel of God, he means the church of God. Now, outside of the book of Galatians, uh, we find the same evidence of who this true Israel is. So let me just list off some verses. Romans 2, 29. Who is a true Jew? A Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. In other words, inward Jewishness is what counts. Romans 4, 11 and 12. Uh, says that Abraham was the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And he was the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of faith. In other words, Abraham, the father of Israel, is actually the father of all who believe. Romans 9, 6 through 8. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to to Israel. Um, in other words, there's a true Israel and then there's a false Israel. Who is the false Israel? That's right. Who is the true Israel? Those who believe, Jew or Gentile. Um, and so, and, and, let me, you can go on and on. There, at every point, Paul is interpreting the Old Testament. Now, if the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16 6, means uh, Jewish Christians like the dispensationalists say, then there just is a separate class of Christians. Um, but this is done away with in every other part of the New Testament. I mean, even in, in, in places where it seems like distinctions, in Romans 1.16, uh, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Um, this, is, this verse is dealing with order. It's not dealing with equality. If you go to the book of Acts, uh, Paul, when he goes to a city, what is the first place that he goes to preach? The synagogues. After he's done preaching at the synagogues, then where does he go? To the Greeks. It's, it's a matter of order. It's not a matter of separate classes. Um, just like the Jews uh, get the gospel preached to them first, the Jews also get punished first. 
In Romans 2, 9, he promises first to punish the Jew and then the Gentile. Now, Israel in the Old Testament, and we saw this just a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 10, Israel was a type or a shadow of the body of Christ. Israel was God's set-apart people. When we get to the New Testament, God reveals His eternal plan that the Gentiles were also to be God's set-apart people, those who believe. And remember, this was part of the Abrahamic promise. He promised Abraham that he would be a father of all nations. Whenever that word nations is used in the Old Testament, it's always referring to Gentile nations. Always. Every single time. So Abraham, from the, the very first promise, that he would be a father of many Gentiles. Um, and, then, and then one more place. Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. Turn there real quick. Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. Listen to how Paul carefully labors to show that Jews and Gentiles are now one body. Starting in verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Let's just stop right there. Even if we didn't have anything else, notice the words he uses. At one time you were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. What does that um, assume now? That you are. Now you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. And he goes on to say as much. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been made brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both, Jew and Gentile, one. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us to God in one body through the Christ through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So then, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That is the work of the gospel. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in a dispensationalist church, so um, that's why I'm a little, you know, excitable about these things, because I, I think they do matter. Again, there are faithful brothers who, who are dispensationalists, but let's talk quickly about some of the consequences of holding to these ideas. What do you think are some, let's just brainstorm together. What do you think are some consequences of holding to dispensationalism? What are, what are some of the fallout? Brian? Uh, some of the scripture doesn't really apply to us. That's right. Essentially, the whole Old Testament which is written to the Jews for the Jews, doesn't really have much bearing on our life, does it? Because Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. It kind of writes the systematic approach to the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, antinomianism has belonged to all different shades of um, theologies, but it, it is worth noting that um, easy believism, which is antinomianism, did what was powerfully promoted by Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, to John MacArthur's credit, he um, fought against it in that whole lordship salvation debate. Um, but my experience has been is that easy believism very much runs in dispensational circles. Okay, Let's, here's one. Uh, another consequence. Um, classical dispensationalism changes um, our anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man. If it was possible to be saved in the Old Testament by following the law, what does that say about the sinfulness of man? That we weren't that sinful, 
that we had the ability to save ourselves back then. And if you say, no, 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 man has never had the ability to save themselves, um, okay, well then nobody was saved in that dispensation. <laughs> That's what we're left with. Um, yeah, you are dead. Yep. 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 Uh, here's another one. Um, this shifts the focus off of the Messiah. Okay, there's an important maxim. The emphasis in our speech is the gospel we preach. Okay, if we're, if we're emphasizing different modes of salvation, if we're emphasizing Israel versus the church, if we're emphasizing, you know, I mean, I mean the, 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 the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, the 1,000-year one, um, millennium. I mean, uh, and, and you often find that in, in dispensationalism, unfortunately. Um, there's a shift from, well, yeah, Christ is totally important, but these things are, are really important too. Well, I mean, in, in one sense, everything in Scripture is important, but remember, um, the Bible doesn't have an egalitarian view when it comes to doctrine, meaning not all doctrines are equal. What doctrine is supreme? The gospel is. But this often displaces those things. Yes? Back when you were talking about how they would believe based on what they was revealed at each dispensation, it almost seems like there's an error in understanding what God's word is. It's like they divide it from this person. Yeah. So um, I believe in these words in this dispensation, therefore I'm saying, well, now I'm believing in these words as if they're separate from who he is. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the verse where it says, all the promises of God are yes and amen. In, in him. him. Yeah. So there's like this, and I don't know how to, what sounds wrong about that, but his word is him. He yeah. is his promises. Yeah. That's what unifies them all. Yeah. But if you don't believe that, that could lead to a like hyper inductive yep. scripture yep. where you're just kind of like narrowly ignoring the rest of it. Yep. Yep. This, this kind of sounds a little bit like our salvation depends on our works rather than well, Schofield definitely said that in, in that study note that I read. I mean, at least in the old dispensation. He definitely said that. And, and that's why there are modern dispensations who have kind of distanced themselves from Schofield a bit. But again, uh, the roots. If at the end of the day, like, so this, this is where MacArthur, MacArthur probably holds to this one more than he holds to this one. Because MacArthur is going to say, no. Christ has always been uh, the, the only way of salvation in every different dispensation. Well, then, th that's the view of covenant theology. Um, where he is going to disagree is on this. And he's going to disagree on his eschatology. I didn't bring in eschatology because, quite frankly, I mean, there's disagreement on eschatology within uh, reform circles. This is what I think is the, 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 the beating heart of the disagreement, S especially this one. Is, is there also a misunderstanding of remission of sins? Because I was thinking of the verse that says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. And so then the Judaizers could be saying, look, we're, we have remission of sins through the sacrifices. But the thing about the remission of sins through the sacrifices is it's not, well, it's, they would view it as effective. Like, like you said, they're regaining their righteousness. Mm -hmm. But is the definition of remission, it doesn't mean you've been perfectly atoned for. It just means um, look to Christ. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a well, and, and the book of Hebrews makes that point. He, he, if the, the blood of those sacrifices could uh, cleanse us, then there wouldn't be a need to keep on coming back. I mean, I mean the, the remnant would have... Un David knew this, brothers and sisters. Okay? The, 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 the true Christians of the Old Testament, they weren't dummies. When David sinned, his great sin with uh, Bathsheba, what did he say in Psalm 51? He said... He said burnt sacrifices you have not desired. In other words, those things cannot atone for my sins. He knew that. 
And then they said the sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> yeah, God gave them the very animals, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let me, um, let me pray and then uh, I think we'll finish there. Father, thank you so much for our time.